Hello and welcome to all to this second session of uh, instrumentation and technique in the 40th ASI meeting 2022. In this session, uh, we are going to have five talks. Four of them would be online. And let's begin this session by invited talk by Dr. Varsha Chitnis from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Varsha, if, uh, you can hear me. Uh, you can take the stage now. Uh, it's uh, I think 25 minutes is good enough for your talk, plus five minutes for question and session. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Varsha. After 20 minutes, I'll just type on the chat window that uh, five minutes to work. Okay. Yeah. So you can start share uh, your screen. Yeah. And yeah. Start. Thank you. Yeah, and just one more thing, participants uh, can talk their questions on the chat window and I'll, I'll pick up one or two at the end of the talk. Hello, good afternoon. Am I audible? Okay. Yes, we can hear you, yes. Yeah, okay. I thank, uh, first of all, organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak in ASI meeting. I will be talking about ground-based very high energy gamma ray astronomy in India. I will be concentrating on observation technique and uh, description of various gamma ray telescopes uh, which were operated in India. Now like X-rays, gamma rays also cannot penetrate terrestrial atmosphere. Lower energies gamma rays are detected using space-based detectors. Satellite-based uh, gamma ray astronomy at MEB in MEB range was uh, initiated in the uh, 1960s when OSO3 was launched. This was followed by some more satellites uh, exploring the uh, MEB region. Uh, later, Cosby satellite explored the uh, universe at GEV energies. And this was followed by IGRET onboard Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, uh, which covered energy range up to 30 GEV. Presently, operational gamma ray missions include Agile and Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. LAT onboard Fermi has extended energy range all the way up to 1 TV. But as we go to higher energy flux from astronomical sources uh, decreases rapidly. So uh, effectively satellite-based detectors are not very useful at energies beyond a few tens of GeV or uh, about 100 GeV. On the other hand, gamma rays with energies above 100 GeV can be detected very efficiently although indirectly using ground-based technique. So plan of my talk is as follows. I will talk about uh, ground-based atmospheric Cherenkov technique and its variants. This will be followed by historical aspects of gamma ray astronomy in India, then currently operational gamma ray telescopes, upcoming projects, and future plans. VHA gamma rays with energy of few tens of GeV to few tens of TeV are detected using atmospheric Cherenkov technique. So here, gamma ray interacts at the top of the atmosphere, produces shower of charged particles. These charged particles cause atmosphere to emit bluish Cherenkov light. This uh, light uh, comes as a flash lasting for a few nanoseconds, and it is spread over a circular region with radius of about 100 meter at observation level. This light is detected using the telescope, which typically consists of a reflector and one or more PMTs at its focus. Now, as this light lasts just for a few nanoseconds, we need fast detectors and fast processing electronics. Also, this Cherenkov light is very faint compared to even night sky background light. So we need detectors with high gain and observations can be carried out only on dark nights from the places where ambient light level is minimal. Now you can see from this figure that this Cherenkov light is spread over huge region. So telescope located anywhere in this pool will detect this Cherenkov light and hence it will indirectly detect incident gamma ray. So collection areas of these telescopes are very large of the order of 10 to the power 4 meters square. And this is the reason this technique is much more efficient compared to satellite based detectors. On the flip side, duty cycle here is quite limited uh, because observations can be carried out only on dark nights when moon is not there in the sky. There are two variants of this technique, wavefront sampling and imaging. Wavefront sampling is older technique where we have a, a distributed array of small size telescope, which records the arrival time of shower front and Cherenkov photon density at various locations. Uh, and here using this arrival time information, one can get direction of uh, shower axis, where a Cherenkov photon density is related to energy of gamma ray photon. Uh, telescope based on this technique include previous generation telescopes like Themistocal, Celeste, Stacy, then packed at Pachmadi, 
amongst presently operation, op operational telescopes, Hagar array is based on this technique. Second technique is imaging technique. Here we have huge reflector with cluster of PMTs at its focus and it records images of air showers. This technique was uh, pioneered by Vipal in late 1980s and this has superior rejection for cosmic ray showers compared to wavefront sampling technique. Now this cosmic rays form formidable background when we are detecting gamma ray signal. Typically for one gamma ray event, we will have something like 1000 cosmic ray events. Imaging technique can reject more than 99% of these cosmic ray showers. Uh, uh, telescopes which are based on imaging technique include previous generation telescopes like Vipal CAT and presently operational tactic MACE. This technique was further improved through stereoscopic operation of uh, multiple imaging telescopes. Stereo imaging was pioneered by Higra and present generation uh, major telescopes like Hayes, Magic, Veritas are based on this technique. VHE camera activities were started in India by TIFR in 1960s at UTI and later this TIFR group moved to Pachmadi in 1980s, whereas VRC started activities in Gulmarg in 1970s and this group also moved to uh, Mount Dabu in 1990s. TIFR operated a 24 telescope array called Pachmadi Array of Cherenkot Telescopes at Pachmadi during 2001 to 2012. Uh, this, uh, this array was based on wavefront sampling technique. Each telescope here consisted of seven paraxially mounted parabolic mirrors with PMT at the focus. And this uh, array recorded arrival time of Cherenkov shower front and Cherenkov photon density at each mirror. Its energy threshold, that is lowest energy it can detect, is 750 GeV, and main targets were blazars and pulsars. BRC group uh, installed imaging telescope called TACTIC at Mount Abu in 1990s. Uh, this is four meter class telescope with eye azimuth mount. Uh, reflector consists of 34 mirror facets and uh, camera consists of 349 PMT pixels. Field of view is 6 degree by 6 degree and pixel size is 0.3 degree. This is the control room where pulses are processed. So once trigger is generated, charge in various PMT pulses is recorded. So this gives images of uh, air showers initiated by gamma rays and cosmic rays. In offline analysis, these images are parameterized and cosmic ray showers are rejected, retaining gamma ray showers. Now, tactic is operational since uh, year 2000, and its energy threshold is about 850 GeV. It can detect crab nebula at five sigma level in 12 hours duration. Main targets for tactic are blazers. Later, a need was felt to uh, reduce energy threshold of atmospheric Cherenkov telescopes and have uh, overlap with satellite-based detectors. So this was essential to detect distant AGNs, GRBs, and pulsars. So one way of uh, uh, reducing energy threshold is to use very large reflector. Another economic way is to install telescope at high altitude location. As you can see in this figure, as one goes to higher altitude, Cherenkov photon density increases. As a result, there is reduction in energy threshold. So HIGRO, that is Himalayan Gamma Ray Observatory uh, collaboration was formed in order to set up atmospheric Cherenkov telescopes at high altitude location in Himalayas. Formally, it is a collaboration between IIT, IFR, and BRC. Later, SINP also contributed to this effort. Hygro telescopes are located at Hanle in Ladakh. Uh, uh, it, they are actually located at Hanle Base Camp at an altitude of 4.3 kilometers. Hagar is the first phase of Hygro, and NACE is the second phase. Hagar or High Altitude Gamma Ray uh, Telescope System is an array of seven telescopes, as you can see here. And these telescopes are based on uh, wavefront sampling technique. Construction and operation of Hagar was led by IA and TIFR. Uh, as in the case of PACT, here also each telescope consists of seven paraxially mounted parabolic mirrors, as you see here. Diameter of each mirror is about one meter, and UV sensitive PMT is mounted at the focus of each mirror. Field of view of Hagar is three degrees, and tracking system is based on ultra azimuth design. Pulses from all these PMTs are brought to the control room using low attenuation coaxial cables, and then they are processed in the control room. The control room located below central telescope. Data acquisition system is CAMAC based and interrupt driven. PMT pulses are combined to form telescope pulses, and trigger is generated on coincidence of at least four telescope pulses out of seven in window of 60 nanoseconds. Data recorded on a trigger includes 
relative arrival time of shower front at each mirror with nanosecond accuracy. This is given by TDCs that is time to digital converter. Then Cherenkov photon density or charge at each telescope given by QDCs. Then absolute arrival time of event my, with microsecond accuracy. This is given by real time clock model synchronized with GPS. In addition to this, telescope pulse profiles are also recorded in one nanosecond bins using waveform digitizer. As CAMEC is becoming obsolete, we have also uh, incorporated BME-based parallel data acquisition system. In this data acquisition system, almost 50% of the models were de developed in-house by our team. So here you can see this data acquisition system. This is high voltage controller from where uh, high voltage is given to PMTs. This is motion control interface in it for central telescope. And using this PC, tracking of all seven telescopes is monitored and controlled. Now, Hagar is operational since year 2008, and so it has observed several blazers and pulsars. Energy threshold of Hagar is estimated to be about 210 GeV. This is factor of three to four lower than that of Pachmadi array, and large part of this reduction is due to operation at high altitude location. Now, Hagar, as I mentioned, is the first phase of high growth. So it gave us experience of operating telescopes at high altitude location, and also it demonstrated reduction in energy threshold at high altitude. And then it paved way for second phase of high growth, that is MACE or Major Atmospheric Chernko experiment. This MACE is led by BRC. It is one of the large size telescopes in the world. In fact, it is the second largest telescope in Northern Hemisphere. The slides on MACE, which I show here are uh, based on presentation given by uh, Dr. Kuldi Piado in, in International Conspiracy Conference last year. So MACE has huge reflector. Uh, it is paraboloid uh, design with 21 meter diameter. It consists of metallic mirror panels. F by D ratio is 1.2. It's a huge structure uh, with height of about uh, 45 meter and weight is about 170 tons. It was designed in such a way that it can operate uh, for wind speeds as high as 30 km per hour. Uh, then the, this is track and wheel assembly at the base, which has diameter of 27 meter. This structure is made up of steel and camera in the focal plane has weight of about 1.2 tons. So design of this mechanical structure was quite challenging as uh, various factors had to be taken into consideration. In fact, fast repositioning is also provided for observing GRBs and other transients. And this uh, telescope can uh, move with the speed of three degree per second. Now here you can see various subsystems of MACE, camera electronics, then there is mirror alignment system, sky monitoring system, mechanical assembly, telescope control unit. Then there is LED calibration system at the center of mirror basket. And also weather station is installed uh, nearby. Uh, then control room setup includes time server, operator workstation, and data archive system. MACE will be remotely operated from PRC Mumbai using Anunet. Here you can see some details of light collector or reflector of MES. It has tessellated design consisting of 356 mirror panels. Each panel has dimension of one meter by one meter. And as you see here, each panel consists of four diamond turned mirror facets. And then there is a silicon dioxide coating for weather protection. Focal distance here is 25 meter. And uh, all these uh, panels have graded focal length to achieve paraboloid design. Here you can see some of the photographs of MES. So MES camera has modular structure. Uh, so each model consists of 16 pips pixels and associated electronics. In front of each PMT light concentrator is mounted in order to collect light which is falling between dead space, uh, in the dead space between PMTs. Here you can see rear, rear view of camera where various electronic subsystems are installed. And here are a few key features of uh, camera electronics. Camera consists of 1,088 PMT pixels. Pixel resolution is 0.125 degrees. Field of view is around 4 degree by 4 degree. And it covers energy range of 20 GeV to 5 TeV. This corresponds to actually large dynamic uh, range, which is covered using low gain and high gain channels. Then there is fast data acquisition system. It is based on domino ring sampler DRS4 with a sampling rate of one giga sample per second. 
pulse pref profile is digitized for the duration of 31 nanosecond. And uh, this system can uh, is designed for handling event rates of about one kilohertz. And event data recorded is something uh, of the size of 40 GB per hour. In mess control room, there is a mess operator console and various subsystem displays. Then there is 50 TB data archive system. Based on simulations, it is expected that MES will have energy threshold of 31 to 52 GeV for zenith angle range of 0 to 40 degrees. And it is expected to detect trap nebula at Phi Sigma significance level in 80 OS seconds observation time. MES installation was completed in October 2020 and then trace run started. Uh, PSF was checked uh, observing Polaris. And here you can see this image of Polaris, which is uh, confined within one pixel. Here you can see one of the images which is uh, of air showers recorded by MES. So this is raw image and this is cleaned image where effects of night sky background and other things are uh, removed. So this uh, validated MES instrumentation and analysis chain. Now here are the pre preliminary results on crab nebula observation. So crab is detected successfully. Uh, details and update on this result actually will be given by Mani Kurana in next talk. Uh, so MES is now operational. It is observing various sources. Presently, bright blazers like Mercurian 421, Mercurian 501, etc., are being observed. And initially, main emphasis would be on pulsar observations. Now, these various telescopes we have seen are based on uh, uh, they have PMT-based camera. But recently, silicon photometers or SIPMs have emerged as a viable alternative for PMTs. SIPMs have uh, several attractive features, like they have higher photon detection efficiency. They need lower bias voltage in the range of 30 to 70 volt, depending on the make. And most attractive feature is that they can be operated safely in bright environment, which is not possible in case of PMTs. So it is possible to conduct observations during partial moonlit part of the night and during some twilight period. So this increases uh, duty cycle of observations. However, there are some disadvantages also, like SIPMs have optical crosstalk, then temperature dependence of gain, which needs to be compensated. Fact telescope at Canary in Canary Islands is the first telescope which used SIPM-based camera. Uh, this telescope has four meter uh, diameter reflector and uh, SIPM camera uh, consists of 1440 pixels. This telescope is operational for last 10 years and it has monitored several bright AGNs. In fact, this type of SIPM-based cameras have been planned for several tel telescopes on upcoming Cherenkov Telescope Array, which is a, a major, uh, major project in our field. This is one big international collaboration. Our group at TIFR is engaged in uh, design and development of uh, SIPM-based camera for four meter class telescope. So this camera will be installed on one of the vertex elements of tactic at Mount Abu. And after testing it at Mount Abu, uh, we plan to ship this telescope uh, to Hanley, install it there uh, to take uh, advantage of high altitude location to reduce energy threshold. This camera has 256 pixels. Its physical size is 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter. It covers field of view of five degree by five degree. Pixel size is 0.3 degree. Each pixel uh, will consist of uh, four by four SIPM array with light concentrator mounted in front of it. Uh, each element of this uh, uh, SIPM array, we refer to it as sub-pixel. It has size of 3 mm by 3 mm. There are 3,600 microcells in each sub-pixel and breakdown voltage is uh, about 50 volt. Uh, it varies with temperature with the coefficient of 54 millivolt per degree Celsius. SIPMs can be operated at temperatures well below zero degrees, and this is really essential for operating telescope at Hanley. Here are design parameters of camera. These are decided taking into account uh, telescope de design and also some inputs from simulations. So this camera should cover dynamic range up to 1500 photoelectrons per pixel, and it should have single photoelectron resolution for small amplitude pulses. Uh, pulses should be recorded uh, uh, with timing resolution of one nanosecond. Then these operations will be carried out on dark nights as well as under twilight moonlight conditions when background rate could be pretty high. Event rate is expected to be less than 100 hertz. 
based on simulations, uh, probably it is something like 20 to 30 hertz for dark nights, but it could be a little higher uh, under twi twilight and moonlight conditions. Entire electronics is to be mounted behind the pixels at the uh, in the focal plane of the camera, similar to mesh. Then power consumption should be restricted within 500 watt. Uh, and then weight of this entire camera should be within 100 kg. Now here you can see schematic representation of this camera. So this camera front end has a modular structure. Each module consists of 16 SIPM pixels and uh, associated front end electronics. There are 16 such modules and back end electronics is mounted in the crate. Here you can see photograph of one 16 pixel cluster module with SIPMs and then these are front end electronics cards like this is pre-amplifier, then bias supply cards for SIPM, and this is low voltage power supply card. Here you can see typical pulses from subpixels and pixel. Bias supply card is designed to supply bias voltage of 50 to 60 volt in our case. It is based on HVAT DC-DC converter from AIT instruments and microcontroller. It provides voltage with temperature compensation to maintain constant gain. Here you can see SIPM pulse amplitude as a function of temperature without compensation and with compensation. So uh, the circuit we have developed is able to maintain constant gain over the temperature range of minus 20 degrees Celsius to plus 30 degrees Celsius. SIPM pulses are given to pre-amplifier card, which is based on trans impedance design. Uh, and this card amplifies subpixel pulses, it shapes them, and then after that, these subpixel pulses are added to generate pixel pulse. So here you can see charge distribution of SIPM pulses. All these peaks correspond to one photoelectron, two photoelectron, three photoelectron, like that. A dynamic range of one to 1500 photoelectrons is covered using low gain and high gain channels, like in the case of MACE. So here, uh, this plot shows linearity of low gain channel. In backend, we have digitizer, then trigger module, and data concentrator module. Digitizer module is based on DRS4, uh, and trigger module generates trigger based on predefined criteria. There are two types of criteria which are uh, which we have incorporated: uh, four NNB, that is four nearest neighbor pixels, and NCT, that is non-collinear triplets, with programmable threshold of eight photoelectrons, ten photoelectrons, etc. Most of our observations will be conducted with NCT condition. Then this data concentrator module, it sends data to PC. Now here you can see all these modules mounted in backend crate. And this is the typical pulse detected using entire setup under laser illumination. Based on simulations, energy threshold is expected to be 510 GeV at Mount Abu and 220 GeV at Hanle. And uh, uh, this is for the trigger condition of uh, non-collinear triplets with 10, 10 photoelectron threshold. Uh, and sensitivity is estimated to be like it will need 100 minutes uh, observation duration to detect crab-like sources at Phi Sigma significance level. Uh, so we have now assembled a, a setup of four models or 64 pixel mini camera in the lab and it's undergoing various tests. Here you can see front view and side view of this setup. And then this is backend electronics and this is light concentrator assembly for 16 pixel module. So presently integrated tests are going on. We plan to test this mini camera at Mount Abu this year. Work is already initiated on remaining camera models and hopefully we'll be able to test this entire camera at Mount Abu next year. After that, this telescope is to be installed at Hanle, and then it will be dedicated for monitoring of blazers. It will give unbiased sampling of several blazers, and it will complement MES telescope. In fact, uh, we can operate it in uh, uh, coordination with FACT in Canary Islands and another telescope, similar telescope, which is coming up in Mexico, so that we can have long stretches of uninterrupted coverage for several blazers. Now, coming to future plans, uh, two more mesh type telescopes are uh, planned so that we can have stereoscopic observations which will further improve sensitivity of mesh. So far we have worked with single mirror or single reflector designs, but there are some advantages associated with dual mirror designs like Schwarzschild Kodai telescope. So design study will be initiated soon. 
and also uh, like we can design SIPM cameras for larger size telescopes like this. Thanks, thanks for you. Thank you very much, Varsha, for a wonderful talk and finishing in time. So additional applause. Right, so stage is open. We can take a couple of questions uh, from the participants. If somebody is there online who wish to ask, please unmute yourself and please ask the question. They can unmute themselves, right? Yeah, if you, the online participants, if you are having any question. You can unmute all, right? This is anyway unmute all, right? Right. So is there a question in the audience here? No? So I'm having, Vasha, you can hear me, right? So Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I noticed uh, something uh, very interesting. Uh, I basically deal with optical UV and IR. So I think uh, you mentioned in the maze, uh, you are using metallic mirrors with the surface roughness of 20 nanometers. Uh, could you please go back to that side where the mirrors are mentioned? Uh, yeah, okay, in. this is SIO2 uh, coating thickness, I think. I see, I see. So because, because this 20 nanometer at 200 nanometer, which is a, a near UV kind of thing, it's yeah. lambda by 10. Yeah, this is, I think, lambda by five kind of surface. Ah, okay. Because yeah. sometimes back yeah, then. Because we don't need uh, really like uh, as good as uh, normal optical telescopes because uh, Cherenkolite, as it is, it has coarse structure. So something like few arc minutes kind of thing. So that's how your requirements are not as stringent as uh, optical telescopes. That's right, that's right. Because sometimes back we have had a discussion with PRL uh, for the uh, uh, mirror, mirror for the UV telescope, and we require that at UV wavelengths, you actually require, you know, lambda by 10 kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's so suddenly said some metallic mirror, it's because we use some kind of very uh, zero door kind of glass. So, yeah. so that's right. Then, uh, if we don't have any more questions, then uh, Thank you very much, uh, Varsha. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. And we'll now move to our next speaker. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mani, Mani uh, Burana. And uh, you're from BRC, Bahabha Atomic Business Center. Wonderful. And she'll be talking about maze data analysis uh, package. So Mani, you are having 15 minutes. And I'll just show you finger uh, when, before five minutes. So now it's all yours. You can share your screen. Already admitted. Right. Am I audible? Good evening, everyone. I'm Mani Khurana from Baba Atomic Research Center. On the behalf of data analysis team, I'm here to talk about maze data analysis package. In this presentation, I'll briefly talk about major atmospheric Cherenkov experiment, gamma ray sources, extensive air shower, imaging atmospheric Cherenkov technique, uh, and about what are the utilities do we have in this package, and what are the results do we get. So this is a, a MACE telescope, and uh, it is installed at Hanle Ladda. Uh, its altitude is around 4.3 kilometers. Energy range is from 20 GV to 5 TeV. It has collection area of around 356 meters square, with a height of 43 meters. Its detector is total number of 1088 PFTs, with a uh, data collection volume is around 80 GV per hour, uh, which is a huge amount of data. This is India's uh, largest telescope with reference to the diameter and world's highest telescope among all gamma ray telescopes. These are the few potential gamma ray sources that can be detected from MACE, such as supernova remnants, pulses, 
एक्टिव कलेक्टिव न्यूक्लियाई गामा रे बर्स डार्क मैटर सो टू स्टडी दीज सोर्सेज वी शुड नो अबाउट एक्सटेंसिव एयर शावर मेस टेलीस्कोप डिटेक्ट बोथ गामा रे एंड कॉस्मिक रे when gamma ray interact with the atmosphere it produces electron positron pair which further gives the cherenkov photons and that photons are allowed to fall on the detector after reflecting from the mirror basket of the telescope uh, at some height of 6 to 10 km uh, we have a maximum number of particles and we call this pool as a shower maximum the effective area of this pool is around 10 is to the power 4 to 10 is to the power 5 meter square on the other hand when cosmic ray interact with the atmosphere it produces many particles out of uh, which few produces gamma ray and further it gives cherenkov photons so the cherenkov photons from the cosmic ray acts as a background and we can see that gamma ray to the cosmic ray ratio is around 1 is to 1000 so the background from the cosmic ray is very huge and it is very difficult to segregate the gamma ray from the cosmic ray so once the shower is developed so from each point we get the cherenkov photons and that is allowed to fall on the detector which forms the image of the shower uh, so this technique is known as imaging atmospheric cherenkov technique it has few advantages like it has large effective area it powerful it has a powerful discrimination capabilities which discriminate discriminate gamma ray from the cosmic rays it accurately analyzes analyzes the longitudinal and the lateral pro profile of the shower image which is found on the detector and we have a few experimental challenges such as it has a very low intensity uh, as compared to the background and the sho uh, shower are very short duration so we need a very fast and sensitive acquisition systems so this is an example of gamma ray and cosmic ray uh, so this is this is a clean image after applying every uh, cleaning uh, algorithms so gamma ray is a sort of elliptical in shape and cosmic ray has an erratic in pattern so we use the helas parameters to differentiate gamma ray from the cosmic ray in this important parameters is alpha this is the angle between the shower axis and the telescope axis so for gamma ray uh, images these points towards the center of the camera so for them alpha will be less and for cosmic ray alpha will be more so this is a road map for uh, maze data analysis package so we have a raw data and volume of this of this data is very large so we cannot transfer the complete data to our system so we convert this to this to data to a root format and then we do the data selection if the event rate is uh, bad we reject those events and do the further analysis if the event rate is fine it's good so and then we do the cleaning and uh, we apply the cleaning algorithm and apply the gain calibration then with the help of uh, helas parameters we do the image parameterization and then with the help of simulate simulation simulated data and the random forest method we do the gamma hadron segregation which further helps in uh, do the energy estimation of the primary gamma so maze data is of two types uh, one is telemetry data and one is event data in telemetry data we have few parameters such as pcr CCR, SCR, and non-node current. In event data, we have sky, LED, Cherenkov. So telemetry data uh, used to uh, check the health of the system, and it also give us the good time interval. Uh, with the sky data, we can remove the constant background that is because of the sky, and with the LED data, we can do the gain calibration. And Cherenkov has the gamma and the cosmic events, which are further used for the data analysis. so these are some data quality check from the led profile we can check the individual channel so this is an example of uh, these are the example of two channel like channel 22 and channel 171 if the led profile is good then we can say okay channel is working fine if led profile is not good so we have to reject these channel during analysis so these are the few other parameters which uh, gives us the good time interval on my axis we have average anode current and average hcr versus time so if there is any sudden fluctuation that could be due to uh, bad sky or due to hardware problems so we have to remove these fluctuations 
So here red portion shows the bad time interval and green portion gives us the good time interval. So this is our outlook of map. It has six utilities. First, it, we can display the telemetry event, events. We can analyze them to get the good time interval. Further, we can do the calibration and PCR analysis. We can display each event and their profiles. And we, we do the data analysis to get the alpha plot and image parameters. So these are the few examples of uh, the clean image. This is a raw image and the right one is the clean image. This is this represents the cosmic ray image. This one is the gamma ray image as it is pointing towards the center of the camera. And this is a muon ring image. Uh, this also represents the cosmic ray image. So now once we get the Hilas parameter of the observation of, our, uh, of observation data, so we compare it with the simulated simulated data parameters. So if all are comparable, as we can see in this uh, picture, so we can say our data quality is good and we can proceed further. So this is an alpha plot. Uh, of, uh, we have uh, detected the, we have uh, done the data analysis on, on 29 Jan, Jan 2022. This is a recent data of the CRAB nebula. On y-axis, we have number of gamma events. On x-axis, we have alpha. So uh, our signal region is within nine degree wind. We are getting excess events of around more than 2000 with a statistical significance of more than eight sigma. So we can see if our statistical significance is greater than five sigma, so we can, we can say we have detected a gamma ray source. We have de detected a gamma from the source, which is crab nebula. This is a spectrum of the same that day data. Uh, we, uh, in y-axis, we have a differential flux and in x-axis, we have energy. We have fitted uh, our MACE data points in the range of energy 60 GV to 500 GV with the power loss spectrum and compared this with the magic spectrum and with the uh, constant parameters and the uh, const, uh, with the index value, we can see it is matching well with the magic. Magic is, a, is an obs observatory at Lavama. So we are getting an extra point in the lower energy range as MACE has a capability to go in this energy range. So we have considered this point, point and fitted with the log parabola function and we can see it fits very well. So these are some future plans. Uh, the science which we can do with MACE is we can uh, find the origin of cosmic rays. We can do the pulsar study. We can study the nature of dark matter by studying the annihilation and decay processes. And also we have developed a package uh, based on Python, root and machine learning, which will work as a standalone package and will get uh, implemented for the better results. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shumani. Uh, again, additional applaud for finishing well within time. Thanks a lot. The stage is open. Uh, I can unshare the screen. Uh, stop share. Great. So uh, now we can take uh, questions. So uh, if from the online participants, if you are having questions, please unmute yourself. Hi, Mudit. Amit here. Hi, Amit. Amit. Yeah. Yeah, please go ahead a bit. Thanks, thanks. Uh, Money, very good talk. I have just a couple of things that uh, you have shown a one point around 30 GVs. Uh, whether this point is also uh, you got through uh, Hilas parameterization or there is another technique to analyze this low energy data than 100 GV. Yeah, hi, Amit. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we have used the random forest method to segregate gamma hydron. And with, with, with that, we got this point. We used okay. the simulated data to train that, and then we got this point. OK. And I have a follow-up question. Is there any plans uh, to introduce deep learning directly to the uh, simulated data to compare with the, uh, with the uh, observed uh, images? 
yeah we are working on that and surely we were we were planning and we'll implement that thing also okay thank you thank you thanks amit uh, thanks mudit anyone else please feel free to unmute yourself and please ask questions and then i'll take questions from the audience here Yeah, if there's no more question, then stage is open for our audience here. We are having some questions. I'm having a very, very, very silly questions. Right, you shown you have shown the your clean images with yeah. hexagonal pixel shape. Why your pixel shapes are hexagonal? Right. Open that presentation. Wait, wait. Yes. This is your reconstructed image, right? This one is reconstructed. Ah, anyway, it's a hexagonal, right? So yeah, I, I'm from the astronomy, so we use this kind of picture shape. Okay, we we have uh, <laughs> detected PMT. Oh, the PMT shape the is ah, the, CPC collector, the shape of the, the pixel. Shape. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vinny, for a wonderful talk. Thanks a lot. We'll now move to our next speaker. Close this thing. This thing as well. So, our uh, Milind, are you here? Yes, yes. Can I hear you? Yes, yes, very much. Very yeah, good. thank you. So, uh, our next speaker is Dr. Milind Naik from uh, TIFR, and he would be speaking about uh, the various uh, near infrared camera on the ground based telescope. Right. So, Milind, it's yours. Please feel free, uh, please share your uh, presentation. And now it's okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Mirin Naik from Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics, IR Group, from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. So today's my presentation is on TFR near infrared astronomy ground-based cameras at Indian telescopes. So so here is an outline of my talk. So I will begin my introduction with the overview of TFR near infrared cameras at various Indian telescopes. Then I will present TIRCAM camera, which is a major camera, and I will discuss focal plane arrays and a controller. Then after that, I will present TENSPEC camera, which is a major guider and a spectrometer. After that, I will discuss, uh, I will present TIRSPEC, which is a major spectrometer. And after that, briefly, I will introduce uh, our work for infrared spectroscopic imaging survey payload, that is IRCS. So I'll begin with the overview of TFR near infrared cameras at various Indian telescopes. So here is a TFR astronomic cameras at various Indian telescopes, past and present. So I've shown here three cameras, TIRCAM2, TILSPEC, and uh, TANSPEC. So first one, this you can see my cursor over here. So TIRCAM1 and 2 at Mount Abu Infrared Observatory. So TIRCAM2 is an upgrade of TIRCAM1. Then here you can see TIRCAM2 at Ayuka Girauli Observatory. And then after that, TIRCAM2 at Devastal Optical Telescope. Uh, this is the at uh, main port, and uh, currently it is at the side port of the DOT. And here at this uh, frame, you can see the TIRSPEC camera, which is at the, um, uh, Himalayan Chandra Telescope or Ladakh. And at the right side, you can see the tensor camera at Devastal Optical Telescope. Uh, now I will present the CAM2 camera. So here are the uh, specification for TFR near infrared imaging camera, this is CAM2. So the, it is currently, as mentioned, it is at the dot Aries Uttarakhand. The wavelength coverage is about 1 to 3.7 micron. Uh, detector is Aladdin 3, 512 by 512 pixel. The cooling method is a cryocooler base. So you can see over here a camera and on top there is a cryocooler cold head is mounted. And this camera is available for observation worldwide. And this camera has a unique feature that within India it is the only camera which operates beyond 2.5 micron and allows us observation in power band that is at 3.27 micron. 
Then it is at the side port. So this allows us near simultaneous NIR observation uh, along with the main port instrument like uh, TFR's transfect spectrometer. And also being on side port allows it to operate for longer time. Whereas the main port instrument is generally a time shared basis uh, use. So here I will present a focal plane array and a PA controller. So here I have shown four detectors uh, that is focal plane arrays. The first one in, is a India antimony focal plane array called Aladdin. This is pi 12 by pi 12 pixel and it is used in Tilcam camera. The second one is a mercury cadmium telluride detector focal plane array. It is called Hawaii one. This is 1K by 1K pixel. It is used in Tilstra camera. And third one, there are two versions of this, the mercury cadmium telluride focal plane array. So it is H1RG and H2RG. So H1RG is a 1K by 1K pixel, whereas H2RG is a 2K by 2K pixel. So these are H1RG and H2RG have been used in TenSpec camera, and H1RG is targeted for IRCIS project. So TIRCAM, TenSpec, TenSpec use generation three commercial controllers from astronomical research camera is. And here I have shown the configuration of this controller. So here is a camera and the uh, Adivar is shown, which is a camera and the controller is there. Then we have a power supply for this controller. And there is a PCI board, which goes into a computer and PCI board and controller is connected over an optical fiber. And at the right side, uh, I have shown the computer and controller and there is blocks. So you can see over here at the left side, this is a computer with a PCI card. And you can see a PCI card over here. And there is a Voodoo GUI, uh, which is written in a Java language. And at the right hand side, you can see the controller, which has a three boards, a timing board, clock board, and a video board. So boards you can see over here. And uh, this uh, connects to a focal plane array. So clocks and bias are provided to the focal plane array. And a video from the focal plane array is taken to the video board and digitized and uh, data is sent to the um, computer over the optical fiber cable. So this timing code has a DSP, whose code is written in the uh, assembly language. And uh, this uh, uh, computer over here is controlled by a laptop uh, at the control room. So here I have shown a local plane array controller. And so this is the video board. It is a eight channel uh, video board and uh, it uses a 16-bit ADC. It has a programmable offset, 12-bit DACs. Then it has a two programmable gain setting and seven programmable bias voltages. So you can see in this uh, block diagram over here, uh, channel one, two, eight are shown. So the, uh, within the channel, we have several blocks like uh, preamplifier, offset adjustment, gain, integrator, ADC. And uh, so for eight channel output of ADC uh, data is fed to a FIFO, this is the digital data, and the FIFO eventually feeds the digital data to the bus. And at the bottom side, you can see the two DAC blocks. Uh, uh, DAC is programmed over a serial bus, and the uh, output of DAC is buffered and uh, used as a offset voltages for this offset adjustment block. And uh, seven of the bias voltages are provided at the connector over here. And uh, these are used for uh, various uh, power supply and bias voltage for focal plane array. And here I have shown a focal plane array controller clock tour. So this is the photograph over here. So it has a 20 clocks and bias voltage channels, 8 bit DC. It has a programmable clock level and programmable clock generation step, basically a text file. So you can write them. And here also we have a serial bus which programs the DAC for high clock level and low clock level. Then we have a switch block over here with this clock switching control. And then this high and low clock level can be is amplified and it will be applied to the clock uh, as a clock to the focal plane array. So here is a, I have shown the TIRCAM2 full frame and sub array mode related work. So here is a, at left side you can see over here it's a full frame image captured by TIRCAM2. And here is a subframe images. These are a few, few set of subframe images, subframe mode images are shown. So you can see that uh, when you capture it at a high speed, you can see start to see the star speckle images. So these are shown over here. And, uh, and on the right side, I have shown the work related to this. So we have done a code modification at PC software 
So for full frame readout and for sub frame, uh, sub array readout, we have the code map fiction. And then also for FITS file timing and TFF filter control interface, this code modification has been done. Then there is also code modification required at controller for the DSP software for full frame readout and sub array, sub -array readout. Then timing uh, for full frame timing, 512 by 526 cells, it is a 256 millisecond. And for a sub array, it is 32 by 32 pixel. The timing is about 10 milliseconds. Uh, sub array mode is primarily used for observation in lunar and planetary occultation of stars and for lucky images. And at the left, I have shown a, a light curve, a typical light curve for a lunar occultation of star, what it can do sub array mode. So here are a uh, few results from the uh, a few examples. For example, where you can see the star from star forming regions, galaxies, then some star clusters over here. This is a sample from the power band, and this is a Pluto occultation done for the atmospheric study. And now I present Tenspec camera. So these are the uh, specification for Tenspec camera. So it is currently at uh, DOT Aries Uttarakhand. The wavelength coverage is 0 0.5 by 2 to 0.5 micron. The spectral resolving power in class is 2750 and in the prison mode 150. It has a reflective slits for guiding. It has a two detector, H2RG and H1RG. It has a hybrid cooling for liquid nitrogen, uh, for detector and optics and triangular. And it's collaboration between TIR, ARIES and MKR USA. This, uh, this allows, this camera allows us uh, simultaneous imaging guiding and spectroscopy with wide coverage from optical, that is 0.5 to NIR to 2.5 micron. And uh, this camera is also available worldwide for observations. So here are few uh, preliminary test results from this camera. Uh, this is uh, uh, argon ion and argon spectra, so 0.55 to 2 .5 micron. Uh, coverage can be seen over here. This is a continuum lamp spectra. And here is a star uh, spectra with the extracted order. And is, here is a imaging mode of the some globular cluster. And you can see the how deep the imaging sensitivity can be seen. So here uh, uh, we have successful simultaneous optical and NR wavelength coverage from 0.55 to 2. micron. And uh, in a, we have a deep imaging sensitivity. So I will now present a test fit camera. So this is the specification. This is a test spec camera. Currently, it is HCT, IIA, and the dark. Uh, and the wavelength coverage is about 1 to 2.5 micron. Spectral result for uh, in cross-display mode is about 1,200. Uh, detector currently is Hawaii one pace, and the cooling is liquid nitrogen cool. This camera is also available worldwide. And observations are done remotely from Crest or Scotty. And uh, this being sideboard allows the near simultaneous and air observation. And we have planned the upgrade of the, the detector from Hawaii 1 to H1 RG targeted in August 2022, which will allow us the faster data capture about four times and better dark current response, better windowing because it's a detector built in feature. So, here are a few results from the respect the star forming region, outward sources, supernova, and the spectroscopic sources. Uh, here is a, a IRC uh, related work. So uh, this is an introduction spectroscopy imaging survey payload. So here is a block diagram. You can see a passive cooling shroud, then telescope, this is 30 centimeter, then fiber fed, two channel spectrometer, and two focal plane arrays. And uh, we have a focal plane controllers over here, and we have an electronics model, which will communicate to the space car. So we will have our own uh, in-house uh, in developed FPA controllers for this project. And for, as part of that, we have developed a prototype H2R JFP controller, which is just uh, blocks like microcontroller, DAC, preamp, etc. It communicates with H2R ROIC, and uh, uh, the data uh, clocks and bias, etc., are generated within the software and the DAC and provided to the H2RJ ROIC and the output from the H2RJ ROIC to preamp fed to the ADC within the microcontroller and the data is given to the USB port of the PC. So here I have shown uh, two images, one the commercial sidecar ASIC controller image and one captured with the TFR IR group prototype image capture. And this is the TFR IR group prototype. So this is our team. Uh, I would like to thank ASI for this opportunity. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Hello. Yeah, thank you very much, Philip, for our yeah. talk and describing the wonderful infrared instrument from the TIFR. Yeah, thank you. We can take a couple of questions. Uh, first, from our online uh, participants. If you are having any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and please ask. The online participants. If you have any question, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Right. If not, then uh, let's uh, check with our participants here if they have any question regarding the presentation, the instrument development. Yeah, I don't see any questions here. Milind, I'm having just a very minor question. Yeah, sure. Uh, about, see the cameras which you are developing, uh, right? This is a part of the instrument, but they can be a standalone package, package itself, right? You can take the camera and just feed it within some separate optical chain. Yes. Right. So, so because what I'm asking is the following, that in most of the time when you design an optical instrument, uh, there is a very stringent requirement that yours, you have to keep your sensor very close to your optics just to minimize the aberrations. Yes. And this has been one of the major shortcoming that why we can't, you know, buy off the shelf cameras and we have to develop our own detector. Uh, detector. Yes. So is there any restriction of how close uh, if uh, you have to make a camera system? So how close your sensor can be uh, to the, you know, uh, the protective glass window? Which you are using it's few mm, five mm, ten mm. Uh, uh, for example, uh, this is the telecam camera, That's and cool. this this uses basically re-imaging optics. So the uh, uh, first image will be formed just near to the window, and then it will be re-imaged, and through the filters will be applied to the detector. That is how the optics is. Yes, yes. So I'm just, I'm just saying that if you just put the sensor there, rather don't go for the re-imaging kind of thing. Yeah, so we will need uh, some kind of uh, filters also there. And uh, for, of course, spectroscopy, we'll have grating and other elements also. So that, those chains will be there. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, to you Milan, for a wonderful talk. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Sandeep uh, Vishwakarma is asking, it's a chat window, uh, what is the use of focal plane array? Uh, focal plane array is like your uh, CCD camera, uh, like your uh, mobile camera. So there you will have a CCD sensor, right? So it is same thing like that. So it is a CMOS uh, sensor in your uh, mobile camera, and this is a special sensor for near infrared detection. Okay, sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. So if there are no more questions, then let's thank uh, Milind again. Thank you very much. We'll move to our next speaker. Then you can stop sharing your screen. Our next speaker is Ms. Anu Jacob uh, from Ayuka. Anu, you are here? Yes. Okay. From Ayuka, right? I've got it right. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. So now, yeah, yeah. Now stage is yours. So please share your presentation. Can you see? And you are having 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Can you see my screen? Uh, no. Why don't I see your screen? Um, moment. I'll try again. Uh, Yes, now I can see that. Could you please make it full screen mode? Yes, yes, it's visible. Please go ahead. Anu, you have to unmute yourself. We are not able to hear you. Yet. 
Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. So um, I'm Anu. I am from, I'm a postdoctoral fellow from Ayuka. Uh, today I'll be discussing about uh, daughter's integral field unit manufacturing, uh, mostly the fiber holder and other aspect and some of the IFU tests. So, so I'll be talking about daughter's. Uh, this is a Devastel optical telescope integral field spectrograph. I'll be talking ab about, sorry. Uh, uh, I'll discuss a little bit about integral field spectroscopy uh, and integral field units, uh, deep reactive ion etching based fiber holder fabrication, uh, our IFU deployment system and some uh, system calibration tests and results. So DOTUS is a backend instrument for the Devastel optical telescope, uh, which is uh, made by Ayuka. This is our uh, DOTUS team. Uh, so various people who have worked in DOTUS on behalf of them, I'll be mainly discussing about the IFU manufacturing part, which is what I mainly work on. So uh, this is a backend instrument for uh, Devastel Optical Telescope. It's a combination of eight identical all refractive spectrographs, which will be sitting in the Cassegrain port of DOT. And uh, one of the interesting aspect of the spectrograph is the multi-deployable uh, IFU unit, integral field unit. So these are okay. These are uh, different aspects of the spectrograph. So the wavelength range is three seventy to four seven forty nanometer. The fiber slit has a uh, eighty mm and it has two eighty eight uh, fibers. Collimator is F four and. Uh, uh, we are using VPH grating to get the good throughput and camera is f1.5 and CCD is a 2k by 4k CCD with 15 micron pixel size. So let's talk what is integral field spectrography. So in spectrographs, usually we use long slits to get the spectra of some object. In integral field spectroscopy, we uh, divide or uh, segment this uh, field uh, into small, small spatial elements. And then we generate a data cube such that you have the spatial and spectral information about the object. In uh, DOTUS, we usually decided to go with uh, lens slits and fibers. So what we have it, it, it in that aspect is you have this micro lens slits where uh, the telescope light is fed through a four optics, some um, pre optics into this, and the fibers feed the light into the spectrograph. So the holder for uh, this system, where you hold the fibers to the back of micro lens, this is very important so that you can get the maximum throughput. So these are very micro structures, so manufacturing them very accurately is very important. On the other end, uh, at the slit end, before it feeds the light into the spectrograph, the fibers are arranged in a slit fashion. And then the spacing between the fibers and other aspects are decided on depending on your CCD and how many uh, pixels you need in the spectra for, the, uh, for each fiber, uh, how much the spatial resolution should be. So uh, in IFU, like I said, making this fiber holder is very important. So first, how well, what we do is we have this micro lens array, which we use in DOTUS. First, you characterize a micro lens array by finding where the fiber should go behind each of this micro lens. So making this holder such that there is no tilt uh, between the uh, 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 in the fiber is uh, very important. So uh, initially, what we used to do was we uh, developed this fiber holder using metal foils by stacking them, uh, drilling holes in, I mean, through lithography, making holes in the metal foils, then stacking them to create a holder such that the fibers can be passed through them very accurately. But uh, these metal drilling, uh, metal fiber holders are usually not very accurate because of inherent properties of lithography process. And it was very difficult to hold them and also thermal expansion problems because fiber and metal contact creates it was also an issue. So we decided to go with another technique, which is uh, uh, the deep reactive ion etching based fiber holder fabrication. This is a nano fabrication process. 
where we uh, make a holder in a silicon wafer, which is much more accurate compared to our previous approach. So where how, there, how, what we have is we have to create a pattern, an array of this uh, holders so that we can cut these and stack them just as in the metal foil, but uh, to a very high accuracy. So the first process in uh, this, uh, first step in this process is uh, we caught the silicon wafer with a photoresist, uh, which is now, which reacts with the wavelength, UV wavelength. So then what we have is we have this particular pattern. This is one part of that pattern, the IFU holder, where this part is where you pass the fibers and associated structures. So that is uh, kept on top of this photoresist layer and uh, it, it is created on a glass sheet and they are kept in contact. Then you expose it to UV light. So what happens is wherever the UV light is hitting, uh, where the, these yellow parts you can see, where the UV light is hitting, that parts becomes chemically soft. So then you can wash it with a developer solution where you get a kind of uh, structure such that uh, the etching is happens in this uh, photoresist layer. Then what we have is, uh, it's a SF6 ion, sulfur hexafluoride uh, uh, gas, uh, which is in the plasma form, is uh, made to bombard with the silicon vapor. So what happens is it will etch out the silicon in this uh, vertical direction. And then there is a uh, C4F8 or C4Cl8 ga gas, which is again used. So I had to do, do a kind of Teflon-like coating on the side walls. So in the next iteration, what happens happens is the uh, again the SF6 is supplied and this process is repeated so that in iterative step you actually drill through the silicon vapor to a very high accuracy because of this iterative step there could be something called scallops the small small structures they are of the order of hundreds of 400 nanometers so which is within very well within the accuracy range we need so that way we can make this structure where you have these holes very precisely drilled uh, and they can be stacked uh, to create the uh, fiber holder. So once the stack is created, what we have next is we will have the stacks on one end and these are kind of comb like structures. All the stacks will be in this end and the, some of the glue is applied into the fiber after passing them through all the stacks. And this stack is pushed along with the glue into the remaining stack to create the fiber holder. So, and uh, this alignment holes, these holes, which are called alignment holes, are used to align the fiber. And this uh, particular shape is to understand which side is the front or back of the stack. So once that is had, we have this small grooves here. They are very small, two point, uh, around 3 mm in dimension. The fiber stacks are placed inside them. And uh, this is a glue. Uh, this is a polishing machine where the stacks are kept and we use the machine to polish the stacks. So after that, we can look the uh, fiber surface through our uh, fiber profilometer for metrology. And we also study the focal ratio degradation in fiber, which is you input one focal ratio, but the output focal ratio will be always faster. So that issue also we can study, even though in our fiber we have calculated so that uh, this degradation is very less. And also the throughput loss uh, is also studied by studying uh, using a power meter. So next step in, uh, in our system was the IFU deployment system, where once you have this IFUs, it, they should go and uh, they, there are they are 16 of them. So they should go and sit in the field so that they can observe the science targets. So positioning them very accurately uh, is very important. So we have our system, IFU deployment system like this. So as you can see here in this box, uh, it sits on the side of this uh, spectrograph. And there are these actuators which deploy the uh, IFU arms. Uh, I'll be showing details. So they sit in the front and the back panel of this IFU deployment system. If you look at one of these panels, uh, for each IFU, uh, there are two actuators and they uh, are moving in this uh, field where the light is being collected. So you can see the actual actuator position. But as you can see, uh, they are uh, accessing the focal plane and this is the uh, IFU, uh, the fiber micro lens array, what you can see here. 
So the problem with this kind of a system is because they are kept so that uh, at different lengths and at different places so that they don't collide with each other. They have different uh, lengths, which causes them to have different flexures. So making a system such that uh, we know uh, the moment of the IFU in the lab setup itself so that we can make a applied versus uh, actual map of all the uh, uh, IFE positions were very important. So we came, uh, we decided to develop a IFE deployment system calibration strategy, which has, uh, which is camera based uh, and uh, having a hexapod to simulate the telescope uh, various uh, operations. So in that system, what we plan to do is we have a camera and the IFU is sitting on a hexapod in this fashion. And then the camera is used to accurately measure the position of the IFUs uh, in, in this method. So we do the camera calibration and then we have to measure uh, the accurate IFU position in its field of view. So we are looking for a 30 micron accuracy in the YZ coordinate, that is this coordinate where the IFUs are moving and also for vibration in the X coordinate, this vibrations of the IFUs, which is around 200 microns. These values are derived from our um, system requirements. So first we calibrate the hexapod where we have uh, a microscope, which is reading out the precise location of a uh, linear scale. And then using our image processing tool, uh, we identify what is the distance and also how much uh, the, uh, the hexapod has displaced. So this is an example how we plan to do it. So for a hexapod, this is how we actually have a, uh, we fit this data and find what is the uh, applied versus actual moment what we get. And this data will be used in file further correction when we have the final system. So in the camera-based uh, metrology tool, which is the next part of the system, what we have is we have a target sheet and a camera. The camera is calibrated uh, using uh, camera calibration tools. Then we have a precise centroiding algorithm, which finds the location of each of the spots. The, this is a 200 cross 200 field of view where you have a set of spots. So the centroid of the, each of the spots are to be identified within 30 micron accuracy. Um, this is the plan what we have. So currently we are at 17.5 uh, micron, plus or minus 17.5 micron accuracy, which we are trying to uh, push it to lower limit in the entire 200 cost 200 field of view. This is a heat map of the accuracy what we are getting currently and uh, get the system working. So in conclusion, I have discussed a little bit about daughter's integral fit spectroscopy, uh, an overview of fiber holder manufacturing with the deep reactive ion etching, um, along with some part of gluing and testing plan, and also some results and tests of uh, IFU deployment system. Thank you. Can you? Yes, thank okay. you. Thank you very much Anu, for a very illuminating talk about showing the complexities of IFU based systems and uh, you calibrate them. So now uh, we can take a couple of questions first from our online participants. If you have a questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and you may ask the question. If you have any question, please feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, if no, then I'll take a question from our audience here. Right. Yes, I know you are having a question, right? Yes. Ah, yeah. Just give me a minute. And uh, thank you for the uh, wonderful talk. Um, could you uh, tell us what, I, I, I might have missed this, could you tell us what the timeline is for deploying uh, this uh, spectrograph on uh, DOT? Uh, you got a question, right? Yeah, the timeline for the spectrograph. Uh, I think uh, in next two years, uh, the production, the, uh, the system will be completed. Uh, first spectrograph we plan to deploy within one year, uh, the whole system, 
uh, eight of them uh, in next two years. Okay, thank you. There's no more question here. Anu, uh, where this uh, this itching process you said, right? Ah, yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah I yeah, forgot sorry. to mention. Yes. So uh, the etching process that is done in collaboration with NNFC Bangalore National Nano Fabrication Center because we need nano, nano fabrication facilities. Right. So uh, it is done in collaboration with them. So we develop uh, uh, the procedure and they do the recipe for us. Right. But you, you haven't yet made the uh, IFU, I mean, inserting the fibers and. No, not yet. Yeah. So we have made an initial system in house, but it was using metal foils, uh, yes. which were not very accurate and had issues. So we are doing the next thing. So the procedure will be almost same, blowing and everything. But the instead of metal foil, we pl plan to use silica wafers, which are same material and much more sturdy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful, Anu, and all the best. Thank so uh, let's move to our uh, next speaker. Anu, you can uh, stop sharing your yes. yeah. So we will now be having the last talk in this session by Abhay Kumar. Abhay, you are here? Ah, yes, sir. Okay, wonderful. Oh, uh, so is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Yeah. You can see your screen. Abhay, you would be having uh, 15 minutes and now stage is all yours. Please go ahead. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to present, uh, sorry, uh, present the SSZ CZTI uh, as a sub MEV spectrometer work and uh, and the hard access spectral states in Cygnus X1. So, uh, the outline of my talk is uh, introduction. Basically, I'll uh, uh, basic tell basic about the SSZ CZTI and then about the Cygnus X1 and uh, different spectral states, uh, uh, which generally people uh, uh, classified based on the uh, hardness intensity diagram that I'll uh, discuss. And then I'll uh, talk about the integral view of the spectral states of Cygnus X1, how they have done and how uh, they have uh, divided, classified the spectral states of the Cygnus X1 in uh, different states. And then uh, I'll show the associate view of the similar uh, work. And then I will move on to the hard X-ray uh, spectrometry, how we can do with the associate CZTI and why it is required. And then I'll summarize my talk. So, so for the brief introduction of the associate CZTI, it is a, a four quadrant uh, 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 the, it is a CZTI detector and uh, and having a four quadrant and uh, it's a pixelated detector and its spectroscopy range is 3200 kV, uh, which uh, it's uh, actually sensitive up to 200 kV, but uh, this coded mask imaging and the spectroscopy range is uh, standard spectroscopy range is 3200 kV. And uh, it is uh, also calibrated to do Compton polarimetry above 100 kV uh, because above the 100 kV, the, the collimator and the coated mass become transparent to higher energy photon. So it behaves as a uh, open detector and uh, using these Compton events, uh, we do the polarization uh, using the associate CZTI. So what happens that uh, since it is a pixelated detector when a photons uh, comes and interacts with the uh, uh, associate CZTI with one of the pixel, and then it get scattered in the, and get absorbed in the surrounding pixel based on the electric field of the incident photons. And then uh, we get the histogram of the this distribution and fit it with the cos square function and get the polarization angle, polarization fraction. Uh, basically, uh, the, the point here is to that uh, we can go beyond 100 kb uh, using this Compton uh, polarimetry event uh, in the associate CZTI. So uh, again, uh, now uh, about the Cygnus X1, uh, Cygnus X1 basically a uh, X-ray binary where the compact object is a black hole and uh, it's a persis persistent hard X-ray source. Uh, it is uh, first detected uh, black hole binary where uh, uh, this it accurate matter from the uh, from the uh, 
uh, this companion object uh, through the wind accretion, and uh, and and it's uh, it's a galactic source, and uh, this is the typical uh, spectrum of the black hole binaries. They are uh, this uh, this disk component we get uh, directly from the disk photons that are coming from the directly from the disk, and there is a this ref reflection component which is basically comes when the disk photons get compromised in the corona and then get reflected uh, uh, through the disk and uh, it gives the reflected, uh, reflected component and uh, the compromised component is uh, basically due to the this uh, disk photon get compromised in the surrounding corona and we get the compromised uh, spectrum. This overall uh, spectrum looks like uh, this. So uh, depending upon the flux and uh, in the different energy range, we uh, basically divide different spectral states in general in black hole binaries. Uh, for that, uh, uh, we uh, use basically the hardness intensity diagram to explain different spectral states in black hole binary. In general, they uh, show Q-safe uh, diagram where uh, Initially, uh, the system is in quiescent state, then it goes into uh, low hard state and then to hard state where uh, this, uh, uh, th there is a, without changing the hardness and then uh, with, uh, with the hard intermediate state, it goes to the high soft state uh, with the with change in the hardness, but the flux remains same and then uh, by changing uh, this, uh, there is a decrease in the flux and uh, what the hardness remains same. So then it comes to the soft intermediate state and then again into the hard intermediate state and get back to the low hard state and then the quiescent state. This is the typical di Q diagram of the low mass X-ray binaries. Uh, but in case of Cygnus X1, it uh, doesn't show the similar uh, pattern uh, that of uh, this Q in general shown by the uh, low mass X-ray binaries, uh, but uh, it shows a part of it. It, uh, it most of the time it remains in the uh, low hard state and then uh, reach to the hard state, uh, high soft state. Uh, and uh, here, uh, this is the Cygnus X1 data. Uh, and this is one of the low mass X-ray binaries, GX339. And uh, here you, you can see this histogram of the data point. So uh, this this peaks at the two hardness indexes uh, in the two regions. So clearly it shows that it most of the time it remains in the uh, low hard state and uh, in the soft state. So sometimes it uh, shows the failed transition of the state. Uh, it sometimes uh, uh, the the the, the state uh, changes from the low hard state to the hard state to the slightly uh, low hardness state and then get back to the low hard state without going to the soft state. So this is uh, these are the main three uh, states that are shown by the uh, Cygnus X1. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, but uh, we can uh, see that the, this hardness uh, Intensity diagram basically depends upon the how we choose the hardness index, hardness energy uh, ranges, two energy ranges for the hardness uh, calculation. So the better way is uh, if we can uh, do uh, this, this uh, analysis using the spectroscopy. Uh, uh, if we can uh, say about the spectral index, uh, say about the spectral states of the uh, black hole binaries uh, depending upon the flux and the spectral index variation. So uh, this is the Cygnus X1, uh, 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 Cygnus X1 uh, different spectral states uh, classified based on the spectral index in the 20, uh, up to 20 kV, which is done by the Greenberg et al. Uh, 2013, uh, where they have uh, fitted the these different instrument data with the broken power law, fixing uh, the break energy at 10 kV, and then uh, then calculated the chi square, and uh, and then uh, by adding the disk uh, 
dB uh, in this uh, this uh, uh, this component into the broken power law, uh, and uh, check whether the chi square is uh, improving or not. Uh, depending upon that, they have uh, based on the spectral index classified the uh, the spectral states into the three categories: uh, this hard state, soft state, and intermediate state. So, uh, so uh, based on that uh, integral have uh, tried to uh, classify the spectral index, uh, spectral uh, states of the Cygnus X1 uh, based on the flux and spectral uh, index variation. So uh, what they have done, they have taken uh, the integral ISGRI uh, 15 years data uh, and uh, fitted the, the uh, fitted the data with the uh, power law in 22 200 kV, avoiding the this reflection and uh, the disk component. Uh, mainly, they uh, try to see how the uh, plasma state changes in the Cygnus X1 in the hard state. So, so here we can see uh, this is the hardness uh, diagram of the uh, ASM and this uh, maxi and wet flux is uh, plotted. And then this is the I uh, flux calculated in the 22 to 100 kV using ICRI uh, data, and uh, this is the uh, spectral index. So uh, this blue uh, represent the hard state, and red uh, represent the uh, 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 red represent the soft state, and green one is the intermediate state. So here in this plot, uh, we can clearly see this index is a good indicator of the hard state. So, uh, and uh, the flux is a good indicator of the soft state. In this plot, uh, we can uh, clearly divide the data into the, uh, this based on the flux, like uh, below 75 uh, uh, unit, this uh, is mainly uh, the soft state and above it is the hard state. Similarly, in the a spectral index basis, we can see that the more, most of the blue points are above uh, sub certain uh, spectral index and uh, the soft and intermediate states are below some certain index. So clearly uh, based on the spectral index and the flux, we can uh, divide the uh, spectral states of the Cygnus X1 in, uh, in different uh, categories. So uh, further what they did, they, uh, they plotted the flux versus spectral index uh, for this 15 year data and uh, then made a 2D histogram, 2D density plot and, uh, and, and seeing that there is a clustering of data at the six uh, places. So here in the, they further divided this, these state, these uh, regions into the different states. Uh, first based on the flux into hard and soft regime and then Hard regime is further divided into the pure hard, transitional hard, hard intermediate uh, region based on the uh, variation correlation of the flux and the spectral index. Like in, in pure state, uh, we see there is uh, no correlation between the flux and spectral index. Uh, in transitional hard, there is slight, uh, uh, slight correlation. Uh, and similarly, in a pure soft state, there is no correlation between the flux and the spectral index. So, uh, so mainly uh, this sickness uh, uh, X1 uh, evolved between the two extreme plasma state. Uh, three minutes to go away. Sorry, sir. Three, three more minutes. Okay, evolved between two extreme plasma state with non-thermal plasma, mainly for the uh, transitional hard state and uh, four transitional state uh, plasma is thermal. And uh, in the pure hard state, there is a no flux uh, correlation that is explained uh, based on the that this they considered the initially the plasma is non-thermal then the these synchrotron seed photons undergo self compromisation and and give the pure uh, hard state similarly for the pure soft state there is a uh, the mainly the non-thermal uh, photons and uh, for the uh, intermediate uh, four states transitional state uh, there is a uh, change in the flux uh, due to the disk and the uh, 
this can the plasma interaction so similarly uh, we try to uh, do this work uh, using the so set so since uh, we have 57 observation of the so set and uh, uh, to make the similar plot uh, we divided these observation into the orbits and uh, and done the analysis for that first we uh, try to uh, uh, try to validate the method. So first we uh, uh, done the uh, fitting uh, using the LexPC and CZTI data uh, of, of the crab and so on that the spectral index and flux uh, are constant and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and it validate the, uh, the, the method. And then uh, we plotted uh, this flux versus uh, spectral index plot uh, similar to that of uh, what integral has done uh, here we can clearly see that uh, this uh, clearly uh, so the similar trend of the integral and uh, but uh, since we have uh, less number of data points so this is uh, in the soft state it is uh, slightly uh, the data points are not that much dense so uh, so that uh, this uh, this conclude that this there are six different speckless states in the Cygnus X1 that we also see in the uh, using the SO set CZTI. So what about uh, above 100 kV, how it uh, looks above 100 kV, whether this uh, spectral uh, uh, influx dependence also can be seen above 100 kV for that we, uh, like earlier I have explained that this uh, SO set CZTI can also work as a uh, Compton polarimeter using these Compton these similar Compton events, we can do the Compton spectroscopy above 100 kV. So uh, it is all uh, already established that it works as a sub ME spectrometer uh, above 100 kV uh, for the GRBs. But in, in case of GRBs, we uh, can get the background uh, pre and post prompt emission. But uh, in case of on axis sources, uh, the background is uh, almost three to six percent of the source, so this background subtraction is very crucial. So uh, this is uh, one of the. Uh, this is the background light curve we here. We can see after band. Uh, sorry. Abhay, could you please wrap it in one or two more minutes? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. One minute. So yeah. when it enters the assay and exit the assay, there is a sudden increase in the background count rate. That is uh, basically uh, due to the low magnetic field even after the assay region in the minus 135 to 45 longitude due to this, uh, there is a charged particle background to, uh, uh, so to further investigate it, what we did, we divided the data into the orbits and then then into the uh, 30 degree longitude and bin and calculated the slope and plotted the slope versus longitude and find out that uh, uh, there is a, uh, the, the source and uh, background doesn't show the similar trend as in 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 the last two uh, bins, uh, because crab is constant, so that that uh, source plus background should follow the background variation. So further, what we did, we divide, we uh, uh, remove these uh, longitude on bins and find out that this uh, the background is gone now. now. And then then further uh, for the uh, since the source and background are not of the same exposure to correct for the exposure, we uh, done the. Uh, phase match uh, using the phase match method, we uh, calculated the uh, constant factor, which is basically the full background count rate uh, by the match region background count rate, and uh, and then uh, we uh, done the spectral fitting of the crab data in 3200 kb, and uh, and uh, 100 to 380 kb, and we uh, uh, find out that this this uh, photon index and is well matched with the integral result. This uh, validate that this we can do Compton polar uh, spectroscopy over 100 kV uh, using the SOSET CZTI. So uh, for the Cygnus X1, we have done some uh, initial uh, analysis uh, uh, which shows uh, there is a, uh, basically the, the, there is a polarization, a spectral index dependence of polarization, uh, but for the uh, spectroscopy, we need to do some further work. Uh, that work is uh, we will do in the future. To summarize, uh, we we see uh, six different spectral states uh, in the Cygnus X1 as seen by the integral, and uh, and uh, also in the future we will do uh, spectroscopy and polarization analysis over 100 kV to see whether there is an uh, 
spectral index dependence of polarization uh, in Cygnus X1. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abhay. Yeah, we can quickly take one or two more questions if uh, you, are, you are having. So first from the online participants, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question if you have. Please feel, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question if you have. If not, then I'll ask uh, the audience here. Yes, please. Abhay, there is a question for you. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, hi, Abhay. Nice talk. So I was wondering, uh, you mentioned like something about uh, lack of data in the soft state. So is it because uh, CZPI uh, has lower uh, flux levels in the soft state or is it because the observation... Right, right. Yes, a lower flux level in the soft state. That's why uh, we are unable to see. But uh, there is uh, some work is going on to update the pipeline. Uh, the uh, so after that, uh, maybe we can uh, see some more uh, data points in that region. Oh, great. Thanks. Yes. So, right. So we don't have any more question. Uh, thank you very much, Abhay. And with this, we have come to the end of this, se this session. And before I close the session, let me thank all the participants, all the speakers, and more important, our volunteers here for a very smooth and completely hassle-free uh, presentations and sessions. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah, again, enjoy ASL.